Madam President, Madam Minister. Mr. President of the International Olympic Committee. Mr. President of the International Paralympic Committee. Madam Commissioner. Madam Co-Chair, Mr. President of the Finnish Sports Confederation, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, dear friends of sport, bienvenue. Bienvenidos. Welcome. Tervetuloa. And welcome to the 6th IWG World Conference on Women and Sport. Well, it's been four years since the last edition of this conference took place in Australia, and we are so excited to see all of you here in Helsinki for what promises to be the next important stepping stone on the advancement of equality, gender equality in sports. Over 800 delegates <laughs> from almost 100 countries. It's an unbelievable, unbelievable result. We are delighted with this great diversity, and it is in the spirit of diversity, greater diversity and tolerance in sport that this event was organized. I am personally happy that the spirit of gender equality in sport and gender equality in general was, was respected in choosing the moderators for this opening ceremony. <laughs> My name is André Noël Chacquer, and I am a man. I know. I know. And this Andrew. great lady, <laughs> and this great lady is Bettina Sogbu, <laughs> one of the great one of the great stars of our national broadcaster here in Finland, Wiley. I work for the Finnish national lottery, Veikkaus. Both of our organizations and companies are firm supporters of this conference. And it's also our great personal honor to be here moderating this historic event this week. It is. And speaking of great ladies, mm. Mm. Our next speaker is someone who has dedicated her life to the sustainable development of sport in her country, in Europe, and later on also on a global level. Uh, for many in the Finnish sports movement, she's the lady who has greatly enriched the country's sport policy for 40 years. Uh, she served the Finnish government for 30 years in the sports sector and retired as director of sport in 2009. Mm. So she retired, but... She is still now in Going the midst, <laughs> midst of a fully active retirement, leading the change as the co-chair of the International Working Group of Women in Sport. Now, please give a warm welcome to Ms. Raja Mattila. President Tarja Halonen, patron of the conference. Mrs. Pia Viitanen, Minister of Housing and other distinguished ministers. Mrs. Andruja Vasiliu, member of the European Commission. Mr. Thomas Bach, president of the International Olympic Committee. Sir Philip Craven, president of the International Paralympic Committee. Mr. Risto Nieminen, President of the Finnish Sport Confederation and National Olympic Committee, representatives of all our cooperative organizations, ladies and gentlemen. I am so delighted to see you all here today in this beautiful Finlandia Hall. The inauguration of the venue, masterpiece of a great man, architect, Alvar Aalto was celebrating in 1971. As a young university student at the time, and when passing by this new building covered with white marble, I remember how proud I felt of the design and of the men who built it. Today I am a big girl, a leader like you, and now it is our turn to change the world for the better in these inspiring surroundings. This is what the next days are all about, leading the change and being the change. As our World Conference on Women and Sport has journeyed from continent to continent, it has been stressed time and time again what an important opportunity the forum is for networking, welcoming in fresh faces, 
and allowing to face-to-face -face interaction and exchange of ideas, frustrations and achievements within and beyond the women and sports movement. Our expectation is that this sixth IWG World Conference will succeed in carving out a place of belonging, solidarity, inspiration, excitement and empowerment, a place for women and sport to call home. For me, for the expert members of the working group of the IWG Secretariat and our team of partners and many supporters, this moment has been four, four years in making. It has been a heroic group of effort to realize this sixth IWG World Conference. With all of you, change makers, gathered here in Helsinki and those tuning in online, we have the honor together on, of commemorating something that has been two decades in making, the 20th anniversary of the Brighton Declaration on Women and Sport. Since its inception in 1994, the declaration has amazed 419 signatories, organizations who have pledged their commitment to realizing gender equality in sport. Many of these organizations are represented here today and have taken part in IWG's progress report. It is this coll collective commitment amongst the most forward-thinking sports bodies, NGOs, GEOs and the like that will sustain the push for gender equality in sport for the next 20 years. But the momentum of this day dates back further still. Many of you here today have in your own unique way devoted your life's work to empowering women, advancing sport. In planning this World Conference, we have aimed to provide a platform for your insights, a means to share your experiences, a forum for understanding how sport has advanced over the years, and to reach for those changes that remain still just beyond our grasp. Although we have poured our hearts and souls into the planning of the conference, it is you, conference delegates, who truly bring this occasion to life. None of this here today would be possible without you. You are more than 800 delegates from all five regions and nearly 100 countries. And for many of you, this is not your first IWG World Conference. May I ask you to please stand or raise your hand if you were present 20 years ago at the very first World Conference on Women and Sport in 1994 in Brighton, UK. <laughs> Please, 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 please. Now, please continue to remain in your position. So, please, once again, up. I, I ask those of you, those of you who attended the second World Conference in 1998 in Windhoek, Namibia, also to stand or raise your hand, and keep standing. How about, how about conferences in 2002 in Montreal, Canada, and 2006 in Kumamoto, Japan? If you were there in attendance, please join in. All up. The fifth IWG World Conference in 2010 in Sydney, Australia. If you were there, please join us. You will be, keep your position. Now, now, to those of you who remain in your seats, to you I can say in jest, better late than never. <laughs> you are also welcome to stand up and raise your hands. <laughs> 20 years of momentum supports us here in Helsinki. Let's have a round of applause in recognition of this tradition that you continue to participate in, in this sixth IWG World Conference on Women and Sport. Thank you.
<laughs> and though we are indeed many, we are not alone. We know that we are a part of something larger, joined by some 5,000 women and men who comprise the IWG, IWG's advocacy network. Change has traditionally been at the core of every IWG conference. For the Sixth World Conference, we look at change from two vantage points through our conference theme, lead the change, be the change. On one hand, this change is personal. How can I be the catalyst of social change? What skills and personal qualities can make me more influential change maker? How can I inspire others to embrace values of gender equality? Am I brave enough to swim against the current? What can I learn from others who have dared to buck the trend and accomplish greatness? On the other hand, we see the need for wide-reaching change, change in social norms and values, expectations, organizational behavior in policies and policy making. For this degree of change, we need leadership. We need leaders. We need you and others like you to lead the change. We need to convince others to appreciate the value in the changes that we are working to see realized in sport in the lives of women and girls worldwide. Our goal is for all, to us, all of us to leave this conference with a clear view of what we can do to be the change and to lead the change. The next few days will build up to the adoption of the legacy at the closing session of this conference. This will be our common commitment for change in the future. It is my sincere pleasure to welcome you to Helsinki, Finland, my home, the home of the IWG during the past four years, your home for the next few days. Welcome, bienvenue, bienvenidos, or as we say in Finland, in two of our official languages, Finnish and Swedish, tervetuloa, velkommen. And without further age, uh, uh, Edo, I'm honored to declare this Sixth World Conference on Women and Sport officially open. Thank you, Madam Co-Chair. I think you have made us all want to go to all future, all future conferences in, in the future, for sure. We need leaders and we have been blessed by many here. This conference has received the great honor of being patroned by one of Finland's most respected leaders. She served as president of the Republic of Finland for 12 years, and, then, and since then she has gone on to promote the cause of equality, sustainability, and human rights throughout the world in many high-profile international forums one of which was her appointment to the high-level pa uh, panel on global sustainability by the Secretary General of the United Nations, Ban Ki-moon, to prepare for the Rio Plus 20 conference. She also continues to chair the Council of Women World Leaders. Please welcome Finland's great leader of change, President Tarja Halonen. Wow, you look wonderful. Okay, so um, I have a big list here of the very honorable persons like Madame Pia Vitonen, Minister of Culture and Housing, other distinguished ministers, Madame Androa Vasilou, member of the European Commission, Mr. Thomas Bach, president of the International Olympic Committee, Sir Philip Craven, president of the International Paralympic Committee, and many, many others. I, I think so that when we are next time in Botswana, it's better to agree that we say only that all respect concerning the protocol. Because the best thing what we can say is, of course, that including all of you I mentioned already by name, dear friends. So as a patron of the sixth 
IWG World Conference on Women and Sport, it is really my great pleasure to see you here at the opening ceremony in such a great numbers. You have traveled far and wide to be here today, from uh, about, as it has mentioned, 100 different countries. Uh, our cultural backgrounds are even more diverse. We have brought with us thousands of experiences and stories uh, that we will share with each other during the coming days, in the meetings and between the meetings. Coffee pauses are extremely important for the international networking. So our diversity is a richness, and we should cherish and take advantage of it. So that's what we say always. Diversity is a resource. Human rights are the way we can guarantee that every person the right to live freely without fear, violence or discrimination, so that we in practice show respect for this diversity. And uh, we have worked a lot for this target in many sectors, in sports and many others. I don't know, I have always the feeling that there was something in this 1990s, because there are so many important conferences and declarations that happened to be just 20 years ago. Um, you have mentioned here already Brighton. Um, I work very much nowadays for the population and development. 20 years ago, we had also the clear advancement um, both at the International Conference on Population and Development in Cairo, and also at the Fourth World Conference on Women in Beijing. And uh, you might remember some others too. And finally, in the year 2000, we adopted the Millennium Development Goals. And I personally remember, as a co-chair of the Millennium Summit, the courage, the spirit we brought uh, world leaders together for a common agenda. And that I think that we have to take our heart with us. But that's very important because uh, the work remains, a lot of work remains to be done. We need to pay more attention to all three aspects, the social, economic, and environmental aspects of sustainable development. Therefore, we should be brave enough again and agree on sustainable development goals for the years after 2015 to see that we can do it. We have this courage to do it. And luckily, we have a lot of resources to that, a lot of untapped resources, especially three categories, women, young, and poor. And all these three categories should be included better in societies and be given equal opportunities, including in sports. One issue especially lacking is the right to decide freely about one's own body, relationships, and having children. And this is the core of the issue to be a human being. Besides of those basic human rights, these Sexual rights are needed so that women, men, girls, and boys can study, work, and be useful members of society. The advanced gender equality policies are needed at all levels, from the families, from the sport clubs, to the national and international level. Working for this is everybody's duty. But let's be very pragmatic. It's also very useful for women to build networks to support each other. And you, brave democratic men, you are also welcome. <laughs> so in the International Working Group on Women and Sport is one example of women's cooperation. And it is a great way to activate women around the world, including you, progressive men. So about sports. Sport is a human right that unites people across the borders, not only in Brazil and Sao Paulo. It serves as a language that we all speak in spite of our differences. Sport brings us together and ideally offers a neutral play playground for gathering. Sport can teach us many things, as you know. 
In the mythical cosmos of sport and physical activity, we learn important life skills, such as leadership skills and determination. Sport empowers us to be the best what we can be. It is particularly important to give empowering possibilities to the girls and women of this planet in those areas of the world where the women's situation in the society is challenging. Sport and physical activity may be one of the few channels through which women and girls can fulfill their aspirations. These experiences may open new doors for women as individuals and as a whole and contribute to the positive change leading towards gender equality in the greater society. But one barrier to women and girls' participation in sport and physical activity is one that exists nearly in all parts of the world, safety issues. It is, say, is it safe for the young girls to practice physical activity? Can women, for example, go out jogging or swimming without facing sexual harassment? We have to address safety issues and raise awareness. Ethical leadership is needed to abolish gender-based violence. I say very, very strongly, we have to learn to see it wherever it is. So, dear friends, sport and physical activity are not only a source of joy and empowerment. We were made to move. Physical inactivity is a major health concern around the globe today. These problems are emphasized in societies where women's and girls' possibilities to practice sports and physical activity are limited. Physical education, notably in schools, is a vital in order for children, girls, girls in particular, to acquire fi basic physical skills and an active lifestyle, to take it as, as, as granted. Physically active women as mothers, leaders, and other role models contribute to a positive cycle where sport as a way of life is transferred to each new generation. In order for humanity to flourish, we need to nurture both the body and the soul. But we also know that sport serves as an excellent tool for education. Women's and girls' education is undoubtedly the most efficient way to build and develop societies. When the potential of the individual women and girls is uncovered, we immediately double our potential as humanity, as you have already mentioned. The development of sport and uh, the society as large depends on women's contribution. Then, dear friends, I have asked also to tell my own personal experience. We Finns are shy. I couldn't write it down, but I think that better, better tell it when I don't see you too well in darkness. <laughs> so um, my mother was very active in sports. I was interested in running, what I did, and, and, and also basketball. Then I got, I, uh, had a baby, I got a baby, a baby girl. And she was extremely interested in gymnastics. And when she was three years old, this, uh, uh, my children, daughter Anna, so she said that we have to go to gymnastics. I was not too much interested in gymnastics, but uh, then we went together and then we attended to the one big uh, Finnish uh, uh, gymnastic festivals uh, in Tampere. And I was there together with my five-year-old daughter, um, together with about 1,500 or 2,000 other mothers and, 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 and uh, children. And it was quite an easy program. But then I turned to the left when I should turn to the right. <laughs> my, my daughter disliked the situation. <laughs> then afterwards, I said to her that, my dear, that there were so many others, nobody could see us, and, and so you can be just relaxed. And then some of my union friends, I was a union lawyer in that time, came and said, hey, we saw you, you, you were there, you turned to the 
wrong direction. And that was the end of the story to the mother and child to be in the same gymnastic organ association. But now comes the best part. I continued in different organizations. I do it still. Um, I'm, I'm a very good amateur. Then my daughter was more and more interested in gymnastics. And the gymnastic performance you will see here later on is the team where she has been within and now coaching. So there are differences, but we are all welcome. Fine. But uh, seriously said, I think so that uh, it's good to say that there is no age limit, no other limitations. We can all be active in the sports. And our family for the generations, as I say, we, we are grateful for all those coaches, all those people who have worked with us and with our children. They have been our co-parents in that way. So women in the Nordic countries live, perhaps according to the researches, in one of the best regions of the world in terms of the gender equality. And uh, Finland as a Nordic country holds a long-standing tradition in advancing women's rights. The capital city Helsinki is thus a very good host for this event that serves as a special platform for discussions and learning from women to women and we are also with open eyes and ears to learn more from you. So it is essential that we women support and teach each other. If we want, who will? In order to achieve the positive change in the whole society, we also need men, like I have mentioned several times. Gender equality is not only a women's cause, it should be a men's cause as well. And I'm very, very convinced you will, go, you will win also very much of that. So the conference team, Lead the Change, Be the Change, invites us to reflect upon our own personal and professional commitment to leading the positive change towards gender equality in sports. I'm pleased to see that many men are present demonstrating their commitment to advancing women's rights and with that, the gender equality. So, when each of us makes the commitment, change is not only possible, it's inevitable. Now we all warmly welcome you here, and I'm very hopeful that next year when we have the Kymnastrada, you will be among the 20, 25,000 women practicing gymnastics. I will be also involved. Thank you. <laughs> Well, actually, she said everything I was going to say. <laughs> because now we, ladies and gentlemen, we arrive at a very special part of the program. Uh, this, uh, what you will see next, is a high-level display of female strength, agility, and beauty. Because this Finnish gymnastics organization is among one of the most successful ones in the world and some of their athletes have won world championship gold medals in aesthetic group gymnastics. But the young team with us today, they will also be reaching for medals in the, the world championships in Moscow later on this year. Uh, the performance we will see is inspired by the life of a great woman who would be 100 years old if she lived today, Edith Piaf. And please welcome these great young women from OVO, the Olari Gymnastics Association.
Padam, padam, padam Il me fait le coup du souviens-toi Il dit rappelle-toi tes amours Rappelle-toi puisque c'est ton tour Il n'y a pas de raison pour que tu ne pleures pas Avec tes souvenirs sur les bras Padam, padam, padam Des tu en voilà par un paquet Et tout ça pour tomber juste au coin de la rue Sur l'air qui m'a reconnu Bravo, bravo, Ovo. Good luck. What, what, wasn't that amazing? And good luck in Moscow. Indeed, good luck yes. to them in Moscow. What amazing athletes they are. Unbelievable. And Do they know, have any bones in their back, spine? I'm sure they have. Let's go and check. <laughs> yeah. You know that Edith, Edith Piaf was my mother's favorite artist. My mother's I'll favorite. I thought your closing well, out Thank for you very much for yeah. sorting my closing out. You're very, very kind. <laughs> Yeah, Edith, yeah Edith, Edith was my mother's favorite artist. And not so much because she was, of course, an amazing singer, but it was really because she started from scratch. She started with barriers. She started with difficulty. And she rose from that difficulty to lead in her art, mm. to go to the top of the world, to perform in L'Olympia, and to for perform in Carnegie Hall. And do you know what you need to lead the change and be the change? What do you need? The Come, most. Courage. Courage yeah. is right. Do we have courage in the room? Yeah. Is there courage in the room? Yeah. We're going to put you to the test. Oh, if, no. If, if Edith Piaf can sing oh, no, in, Andre, no, no, no. in, in, uh, uh, in, uh, in Olympia, if she can sing in Carnegie Hall, you can all sing Edith Piaf in Finlandia Hall. Yeah. Oh. We're going to start you very easy, even you, Mr. President. <laughs> <laughs> it's a French waltz, like this. Un, deux, trois. Like this. Can you do this with your, with your hand? Yes? Yes? Could you move from side to side a little bit? Show that you are really, really moving towards change. Okay, are you ready? And whenever I say it's your cue, you attack this song, okay? It goes like this. Un air qui m'obsède jour et nuit Pourtant n'est pas né d'aujourd'hui Il vient aussi loin que je viens Traîné par cent mille musiciens Un jour cette heure me rendra fou Cent fois j'ai voulu dire pourquoi Mais sans cesse elle me coupe la parole Elle parle toujours avant moi Et sa voix couvre ma voix Ah, 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 this is your part. Et padam, padam, padam. Elle revient après moi en criant encore. Padam, padam, padam. Elle me fait le coup du souviens-toi. Et padam, padam, padam. C'est elle qui me montre du doigt et qui traîne après moi comme une grande terreur. C'est elle qui sait. Bravo. Yes. Yes. Wow. Bravo. You have courage. Bravo. I've never been to Quebec, but are are they all like you? They're worse. <laughs>
Anyway, <laughs> I've tried to, some finished <clears throat> sisu here. I try to talk now after this <clears throat> performance because now <laughs> it gives me great pleasure now to welcome to the stage a man who has dedicated his life to Olympism. He is one of the few people in the world who have been in attendance at every Olympic Games since 1964. For <laughs> Before I was born. Was it? Yep. Yeah, it's Believe it or not. Believe it or not, it was before I was born as well. I've well, uh, <laughs> first in five Olympic Games as an Olympic sailor, and then since 1976 as Finland's IOC member, please welcome a man full of Finnish Olympic heritage, Mr. Peter Talberg. Hello. My first games were 1960. 60? Oh. That's way before I was born. <laughs> <laughs> That's even better. Anyway, you've been to so many uh, great sporting events, uh, big sporting events. Uh, but how would you define the, 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 um, how important, how significant is this uh, conference? Well, this is one of the most important conferences altogether. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry for a, a bad voice, <laughs> but uh, this is the most important conference we could have in Finland. Mm -hmm. Now, you have been involved on, in making this reality. And of course, uh, it's a lot through all the people you met through sports over the years. And you brought a photograph, OK? So, ah. bing. Oh, that's an interesting photograph, isn't it? There it is. Oh, there they are. <laughs> <laughs> who are these people? Yeah, would you tell us a little bit? When was this taken and who are the people in the picture? Well, actually, in 1981, President Samaransha asked me, said, well, there are 38 Olympic gold medal winners in Baden-Baden, Germany. And I, I have decided that there will be formed an athletes commission within the IOC. <laughs> and you, Peter, you are, until now, the only IOC member who, whilst being an IOC member, has participated in the Games, mm -hmm. which I did in Moscow. So he said, you will choose six athletes that will be the first IOC Athletes Commission, and, and you will have to choose people who are interested in decision-making and not only to jump and run and play on the field. Mm. So I got this task, and if you look at those people... So you they're see, your choice, Peter, they're your choice. This was my choice, uh, choice yes, and together with Donna de Varuna, who is also Donna here today. Donna was helping me in Baden-Baden. Most to the left, you see somebody quite important, Sebastian Go. Where yeah, I recognize Sebastian, yeah, yeah, sure. Where is he today? He leads the British Olympic Committee and organized the London Games, yeah. a decision maker. Number two, on that side, is Vladislav Tretjak, the Russian uh, ice hockey okay. president who just won the, the, the World Championship for Russia mm -hmm. in ice hockey. Yeah. Then in the middle, the lady is Svetla Tsetova. She is today a technical director of International Row. Mm. Then you have me, myself. Uh, who looking good, looking very well, good. <laughs> younger. Still, still looking good. <laughs> then you have Kit Kano, the runner from Kenya, today president Legend. of the Kenyan Olympic Committee. Very good guy. And then most to the right, Ivar Formo. He was a Norwegian skier. He unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. So this was actually the group. Mm -hmm. But there's one guy you, you sort of skipped now. There's uh, ah, yeah, a gentleman in a white shirt yeah. that looks slightly familiar. Yes. Who uh, would the, that be? The small guy in the white with a funny sort of <laughs> thing, thing around here. I guess that must have been Thomas Bach. Oh, yes. ah. <laughs> Welcome, Mr. President. Russia. 
Welcome to the President of the International Olympic Committee, Mr. Thomas Bach. <laughs> Looking good still. Yeah. Hello. 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 <laughs> Welcome. Please. Don't. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, really nice uh, welcome. I don't know whether I like this photo too much, but uh, <laughs> everybody has his sins in the youth. So, uh, um, Mrs. Uh, the President, I, I'm afraid uh, my list of names is even longer than yours. So I uh, say, uh, Madam uh, President, uh, Hallon and all protocol observed. Um, maybe I should, uh, I should uh, say welcome uh, to Monsieur Piaf, uh, who uh, surprised us uh, with this uh, performance here. I, I have to admit uh, that I did not sing. This is why it was uh, so harmonious here in, in the room, because uh, my, my only musical talent uh, is my name. And uh, therefore, it is, uh, it is really a, a, a pleasure being uh, with you here today, uh, even if it is not my free will. Um, <laughs> Uh, because uh, you, you just uh, saw my, my boss and teacher in, in the IOC, Peter Talberg, introducing me. And uh, so uh, you can imagine uh, what happened uh, uh, when he uh, asked me uh, whether I would not uh, attend uh, this uh, conference in, in Helsinki. Uh, so uh, knowing Peter a little bit, uh, I took uh, this uh, invitation as it was meant to be. Um, I took it as an order, and uh, and, uh, and and here I am. So I was not too disappointed uh, that I was not allowed to stand up uh, because of formal participations in conferences uh, here. But uh, I was, however, disappointed uh, that uh, you were not asking uh, who has already visited uh, the place of the seventh conference. <laughs> and uh, because then uh, this would have given me the opportunity to stand up uh, and to stand up alone, <laughs> uh, because I was just last week in Botswana. And I can tell you, I can tell you, the stage is set for you. But now we are here in Helsinki, we're in, in Finland, a country which is uh, very proud about uh, all its uh, achievements uh, in uh, women's uh, rights and having uh, granted uh, the right to women to vote already in uh, 1906. Uh, sorry, Mrs. President, uh, six years earlier, the International Olympic Committee had already the opened the Olympic Games to women. Uh, it was, uh, admittedly, it was a, a small, a little step, and it was only about active participation, but uh, because uh, when it comes to, to leadership, uh, then it took uh, some years more, some very few years more, about uh, 80, but um, uh, then, since uh, then uh, we are really uh, developing in uh, uh, this uh, direction and uh, we are trying uh, to defy discrimination and social pressure to allow women to compete and to participate in uh, decision making. Because also in this respect, it is true that uh, the Olympic Games, uh, that uh, the Olympic uh, movement, that sport is always about uh, breaking down walls and building bridges. And in sport has been and continues to be a vital tool to show that this is possible. 
And this is uh, written down in the Olympic Charter, our constitution, where we say that uh, sport should be available to all, to all, regardless of gender, race, ethnicity, or any other form of uh, discrimination, uh, be it uh, social or uh, be it because of sexual orientation. The Olympic Charter compels uh, the IOC to encourage and support the promotion of women in sports at all levels. As a sport organization, we cannot force countries to change their legislation, but what we can do <coughs> is giving an example. Giving an example that it is uh, possible that a society based on these core beliefs is possible and does even work better. Women have competed at the Games since 1900. There it was a percentage of 2.2. Now in London 2012, that figure was uh, approaching parity with uh, about 45% uh, of competitors being women athletes. And some of the most important teams, like uh, Team Finland, for example, thank you and congratulations, Team Finland, and some other teams had more women uh, members than men. The London Games, The London Games also saw another significant landmark with women competing in every sport. And we are particularly happy to be able to say that for the first time every National Olympic Committee had sent women athletes to an edition of the Games. In this respect, we know that this goes not without saying that we have to work closely also in the future with uh, our National Olympic Committees, uh, with uh, colleagues in different uh, countries uh, of uh, the world. But it is not enough to send women to the Games if girls are denied opportunities to participate in sport every day. On a recent trip to Saudi Arabia, we heard of the progress the sporting movement is making in that country to finally introduce sport for young women in the education system. We offered our help and that of our colleagues at the international federations in introducing a plan of action. And we are happy that the signals of progress are being made. The advisory parliament uh, has in the meantime proposed to encourage girls to play sport and even to make it part of the school curriculum. We hope that the government of Saudi Arabia will follow this uh, recommendation and that uh, soon also in Saudi Arabia we will see girls practicing sports every day in their life and at their free choice. We are all here today to celebrate uh, the signing of the Brighton Declaration 20 years ago, a call to action for government, civil society, business, universities, research institutions, and sports organizations. Indeed, uh, the IOC is happy and proud to be one of the first signatories of this groundbreaking document. We have all of us made a lot of progress over the, over the last 20 years and the IOC, we will continue to spread our values and work towards equality. As you all know, it is not easy to change cultural norms that have been passed down from generation to generation. It requires a team effort by players at all levels and every step counts. But sports can help to change attitudes and show how women can and should play an equal role in sport at all levels and by extension in society at large. Every step counts. That also means that the journey is not over yet. 
The IOC's Women in Sport Commission, ably led for many years by Anita de France, who is uh, with us here this evening, a member of the IOC Executive Board, has been a catalyst for positive change in three priority areas. First, increasing participation in the Olympic Games and access to sport at the grassroots level. Second, promoting gender equality in sport. Third, increasing the number of women in sports leadership roles. And with regard to this, we must do more. We must do more to bring women into the sports leadership. We have seen what women can do on the field of play. But we definitely need their intellect, their energy, and their creativity in the administration and management of sport as well. Two decades ago, the IOC set the goal of having at least 20% of sport decision-making positions filled by women by 2005. The IOC has achieved this uh, goal, and I'm happy uh, to report uh, that in the IOC Executive Board, we have now four women out of 15 members overall. And we hope very much that women athletes increasingly move on from competing to taking up roles in administration and management, that they are ready to take responsibility also after their sporting career. Our work continues, and following the recommendations from the fifth IOC Conference on Women in Sport just two years ago in Los Angeles, the IOC developed a strategic plan with a series of concrete actions to close the gender gap in sports leadership. The new initiatives include mentoring programs, using role models from sports and sports administration, and enhanced outreach to ensure gender balance. The IOC supported training for almost 4,000 female administrators and managers during the last Olympiad from 19, 2009 to 2012, with more training programs to encourage self-empowerment and build leadership skills. The IOC is also providing coaching and athletic scholarships, as well as degree programs for women. More than 100 female coaches, almost 600 female athletes, and almost 50 fem female teams striving to participate in the 2010 Vancouver and the 2012 London Olympic Games benefited from these kind of scholarships. Just recently, I had uh, the privilege to sign a memorandum of understanding with the United Nations to maximize the collaboration across both our organizations. Indeed, it was uh, UN General Secretary Ban Ki-moon, who said, UN values, United Nation values are Olympic values. In this respect, this agreement will strengthen our work in a range of fields, including quality physical education in school settings, girls' and women's empowerment, and healthy lifestyles promotion. The IOC is already working with UN Women and with UNESCO and other stakeholders, but we plan to create an observatory for women, sport, and physical education that will help measure progress towards equality. Another new initiative will create a digital platform to highlight successful programs and best practices and make them available for everybody. We're also taking action to improve our own record. Earlier this year, I had the opportunity to announce new IOC commissions, and as a result, there were 22 more women added to all the commissions. There were two more women chairs for the commissions, and the female representation from Africa was increased by 50%. <laughs> The 
The IOC can and will help lead the change, but we also won't be the change. And in this respect, uh, we will have a broad discussion on gender uh, equality and all uh, related uh, issues uh, during uh, our Olympic Agenda 2020 discussion, starting with working groups uh, from next uh, the Monday on, where we will address these issues where we will develop new ideas, I hope, where we will give the initiative uh, for new actions, and uh, we are really looking forward uh, for your input into uh, this uh, discussion, into this uh, Olympic Agenda 2020, to tell us how you see our potential, how you see our possibilities, and which advice uh, you can uh, give us you are very much uh, uh, welcome. And then I hope uh, that at the end of the year, our uh, IOC members uh, will approve uh, this uh, paper of change, uh, will approve uh, this uh, Olympic Agenda uh, 2020, and show that sport has a great value as an effective tool for gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls. To make more progress in our quest for this gender equality and open access to physical activity for girls and women worldwide, we need close cooperation with governments, educational institutions, the private sector and civil society at all levels. We cannot do this alone. We need to partner up with the society at large and we need to partner up with you. There, again, every step counts. And being here today, for me at least, is an important step. The IWG and all of you are also leading the change, and I would like to thank you for this. I will leave here convinced that sport can play an important role in building the bridges to end discrimination. And I will leave here as determined as ever that sport can send this powerful message to the world. Enjoy this uh, conference. Don't forget that uh, with all the interesting and important discussion, sport and physical activity is also always about uh, joy in life. So enjoy the conference, have a fruitful discussion, and send us your recommendations as soon as possible. We are looking forward to this. Thank you very much for having me here. You have flowers. A little surprise for you, Mr. President. Thank you for your commitment. Thank you very much. <laughs> Where are you coming from? Who told you to be here? Geisler. Huh? Huh? You liked it to come here or you were told to come here? Geisler. Geisler. <laughs> Thank you. You are a very diplomatic girl. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nice haircut. Yes. <laughs> President Thomas Bach. Thank you so much, Mr. President. Thank you. Thank you. President Bach, you, you can't sing, but you, you definitely, definitely speak very well. <laughs> very well. Thank you for all those commitments. Thank you so much. And now we have the pleasure of welcoming a man who has been a great advocate and leader for the cause of diversity in sport. He is the president of the International Paralympic Committee. A former athlete, he was an elite wheelchair, uh, wheelchair basketball player. He has been president of the International Paralympic Committee since the year 2001. And since then, he has definitely brought his movement, or the, the entire Paralympic movement, through many hoops towards greater and genuine inclusiveness and gender equality in sport. Please give a warm welcome to Sir Philip Craven.
Well, thank you uh, for that introduction, and um, it is really great to be here. And uh, following on from uh, other speakers, um, uh, lack of use of total protocol, Madame la Présidente, and all friends of women, and hopefully of men also. Uh, great to be here at the sixth conference. Uh, the fact that I couldn't stand was immaterial. I haven't been to the uh, previous five, I had to uh, admit that. Um, but I have tried to interact as closely as I can with women for some considerable time. Um, equality, well, yes, equality is, uh, is one of the four values of the Paralympic movement. Courage is another, believe it or not, and uh, followed by determination and then inspiration. But as I said at the press conference, where is it? I know, of course, I've got my slides up there now. But, um, but leading the change and being the change, I think it's a wonderful title for the three days that everybody's going to spend together. Um, leading, well, for me, leading, it's, uh, it's creating an environment where you encourage everyone to come forward if they have the sufficient either skills, but particularly the determination and will to do something in their lives, and in our case, to do something with sport. So we have to create an environment, but then we all have to be the change. And you know how many of you have had that situation where you've been in a meeting, should I put my hand up, should I not, should I put my hand up, should I not? And, uh, and, I'll, and if you think there's something to be done, don't think the person next to you will necessarily do it. Do it yourself, and then it'll get done. So, uh, I see we've gone on to the second slide already. It's not a problem, but just leave, leave that lady there. Um, that, um, but really, uh, already there's an amazing spirit here great friendship, happiness, it would appear, uh, also, and I'm very, very happy about that. Um, but you know, when the real Edith Piaf's name was mentioned, uh, that gave me an extra buzz. All the hairs went up on my arm, and that woman had something incredible. I never knew her, of course, uh, but she was what spirit is all about. And. Um, I believe that we've got amazing opportunities here. Now, we've moved on a little bit too quick here. Can I go back to the second slide? That's it, that's perfect. So, just leave it there for now. And uh, so we know, it's already been said, women have a significant role to play in sport at all levels. As athletes, as coaches, as officials, and leaders. They see things differently to men, and thank God that you do. And through the IPC's Women in Sport Committee, we aim to ensure greater gender equality across all of the Paralympic movement. Here you see Natalia Partika of Poland, who competed for Poland in both the Olympic and the Paralympic Games in Beijing and London. Moving on to slide three. But just by the very nature of what we do, the IPC strives for equality and challenges stereotypes on a daily basis. We tackle double discrimination, discrimination against impairment and discrimination against women, both of which are wrongly perceived as limiting what you can achieve in life. Formed in 2002, and there's great Anozi of Nigeria. You don't want to mess with her, I can tell you. Formed in 2002, one of the objectives of the IPC's Women in Sport Committee, led by Teen Teilman of Denmark, is to increase awareness and understanding of gender equality within and outside of the Paralympic movement. And one way in which it is, we are achieving this goal is through the Paralympic Games. From London, the world's third biggest sporting event, and an event that has developed an enviable track record for tackling stereotypes, changing perceptions, and breaking down barriers. Now here you see Tatia McFadden, probably the greatest track athlete in the world today. And I mean, that's anybody on the track today. Won five gold medals at the World Championships last year, and 
won f all four of the main marathons last year in Boston, in Chicago, in New York, and in London, and then switched to cross-country skiing in, uh, in Sochi and got a, got a silver. But really an amazing athlete, a Russian adopted by American parents, and back in Sochi, she met her birth, birth mother for the first time. So a very emotional situation, but probably the greatest track athlete in the world. Our aim with the Games is gender parity in terms of participation and in the number of medal events for each sex. By 2016, around 1,650 women, roughly 38% of all athletes, will compete in the Rio Paralympic Games. More than double the 790 who competed just after the Brighton Declaration in Atlanta in 96. Women will also compete in 43% of all medal events, a 12% rise on London 2012, which has been partly helped by the introduction of two new sports, para canoe and para triathlon, two sports that will make the Games their debut in Rio, both offering the same number of events for women and for men. Although the figures are improve, improving, as uh, President Bach said, we're still facing major challenges. For example, at London, one in three participating countries had no female athletes. I'm not referring to the Olympic Games now, I'm, refer I'm referring to something later about uh, what President Bach said. Had no female athletes, while sports such as football five and seven aside in the Summer Games have no women's competitions. In the Winter Paralympics, female participation has grown from one in five at the Nagano Games in 98 to one in four in Sochi earlier this year. Ice sledge hockey, one of five sports on our program, is still only open to male athletes, although measures are in place to address this by 2022. But to try and achieve gender parity in the Games, the growth has to be organic. And this, I think, is where I was referring back to uh, what President Bach said, and has to come from the grassroots. It's no use creating more medal events for women if there are not enough athletes to compete at the highest level. Increasing participation is not easy, especially in countries where there are cultural barriers to women practicing sport. Role models are essential, and I'm delighted to see so many female Paralympians coming through who can inspire the next generation. This is Esther Vergeer of the Netherlands, the greatest, uh, probably the greatest wheelchair tennis player ever. She retired uh, after London, and now she's set up her own foundation, and she's gonna put back into Paralympic sport what she got out of it, which is fantastic. At just 22 years old, the Dutch blade runner, Malu van Rijn, here again from the Netherlands. I don't know why I'm concentrating on that orange country, but I seem to be, has the potential to become the most marketable Paralympian on the planet. And now we go to Zara Nemati, the first, here we go, the first Iranian woman. I'm gonna have a drink. Cue for a drink. The first Iranian woman to win a Paralympic or Olympic gold medal in archery. She's really inspired thousands of women to get involved in sport in her home country and can't be with us today because she's at the United Nations in New, in New York. Coaching is also key and it's important that strategies are implemented to increase the number of female elite coaches who can not only train more women, but also of course, more men. Here we see Jenny Archer, the coach of Great Britain's David Weir, a six-time Paralympic champion in wheelchair racing, one of the real heroes of London 2012. And this is perfect evidence of how a woman can rise to the top in international coaching and succeed. The Women in Sport Committee also strives to develop female leadership within the Paralympic movement. And is finding this a more challenging area than increasing female participation in sport. Across the whole IPC membership, covering national Paralympic committees, international sport federations, 
and organisations and regional organisations, just 24% of all key decision-making positions are taken by women. This issue was further highlighted last November when there were only four candidates out of 27 for the IPC General Assembly for, our, for President, Vice President and 10 Governing Board members. Although three were elected, they are still greatly outnumbered by nine men and we want you women to change that for us. Thank you very much. To tackle this issue, the Agitos Foundation, the IPC's development arm, launched a programme called Woe Mentoring in May, which aims to increase the number of women in leadership positions to 30%. The mentoring project, which is initially a pilot targeting Europe, involves 33, 32 women from 20 IPC member organisations. And the aim is that over the next two years, mentees will gain and develop the tools and knowledge to continue to make their mark in sport. The mentors are experienced in a wide variety of sports organisations from both within and outside of the Paralympic movement, whilst the mentees are equally as varied from athletes and coaches to secretaries and even some existing board members. If successful, the pilot will be rolled out globally and hopefully soon we can see the same progress off the field of play as we have seen on it in recent years. On March the 8th, in accordance with the United Nations Women's Day, the IPC presents each year our International Women's Day Recognition Award to influ influential women within the Paralympic movement. Here we are in Sochi, and it may seem that I am being presented with the medal, though I can assure you that I am presenting it to Rima Batalova, who at the time was a vice president of the Russian National Paralympic Committee and is a 13-time Paralympic champion. Before I close, I'd like to thank Tina Tileman and fellow members of the IPC Women in Sports Committee. I'd also like to draw your attention to this lady, Bibian Mental Spee of the Netherlands. She won, here we go. <laughs> she won gold in Sochi in the first ever time that para snowboard took place in the games. And that's also thanks to our Russian colleagues who made that happen along with ourselves. But the key here is not the gold medal, but that she campaigned for years for snowboard to be in the games. And then she went along and won a gold medal. I'd also like to thank Anita de France and the IOC's committee, of which Teen is an active member. And it was a great, great experience, as I said in the press conference, to be at the IOC Women in Sport uh, conference in 2003 in Marrakesh, when, like here, I think there were about 30 men and 600 women. And I just really realized what an effect it must be for women when they find themselves in that similar position. It was a very, very great experience that uh, I hope I learned from. And I think also this, where we have a member on an IOC commission, and similarly we have uh, the chairperson of the IOC Athletes Commission, also on the IPC Athletes Council. I think it shows that there's great cooperation between our two organizations. And I'd like to thank Thomas and his predecessor, Jacques Rogge, for that happening and that continuing to happen. So, quite simply, sport needs more women. And the IPC is fully committed to gender parity. I'd just like to finish by the words of a great uh, Australian Paralympian uh, called uh, Donna Ritchie. And uh, she captained the women's uh, wheelchair basketball team in, in 2000 in Sydney. And at the end of our vision, we talk about uh, exciting and in, uh, inspiring and exciting the world. And before we inspire and excite, we probably surprise the world by the athletic performances. And then if we succeed then in inspiring and exciting, then we look to transform the world and change people's minds. And so she encapsulated it uh, just in these really two sentences. She said, Paralympians don't have the time to worry about what doesn't work. They just maximize what does. So I think if we can take that with us and maximize what every abilities you have, we're on a really good wicket here to lead the change 
and to be definitely part of that change. Thank you very much. Sir Philip, thank you for that okay. inspiring speech. We want to maximize you. Hello we want there. to maximize everything that you are in the context of a discussion you graciously have accepted to discuss with a great leader of, um, in the Olympic movement of gender equality. This is a fantastic, fantastic athlete and women leader in the Olympic movement. She is an Olympian, a medalist from 1976, an IOC member from 1986, the, the first chairman of the IOC Women's Commission. Uh, back uh, only a year after Brighton in 1995. She was also the first vice president of the International Olympic Committee. We're going to ask her to join Sir Philip for a conversation, a discussion on how, what we can do in concrete terms to, well, lead the change and be the change. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ms. Anita de France. <laughs> Please join us. I guess my microphone. Yes, it's on. Good. It's on. How are you, Anita? Good, thank you. Listen, thank you for taking the time to enter into this discussion. We thought that we could, we could uh, go a little bit deeper, a little bit deeper into what you perceive being the change up until this point and perhaps what we can do into the future, perhaps in more concrete terms. My opening question to you in, in your discussion would be to look at what are, or what is the most fundamental change that has occurred in favor of greater gender equality in your time in the Olympic and Paralympic movement? What would it be if you had to, one thing to say? Most fundamental change up until now. Ladies first. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> well, um, go for you want to go first, all right? Yeah. Or, or okay. if you want to go, that's it. I'm second. just kidding. Please, go ahead. But I'm not going to be very concrete. I think, uh, you know, I, I told you what the end of our vision was, but the beginning of it is to enable Paralympic athletes to achieve sporting excellence, and then they inspire and excite the world. Probably the most important word there is enable. We've heard the word empower. And, uh, and so we don't do it for athletes. They do it for themselves. But I think you've got to create an environment. You've got to create a stage That's upon concrete. which yeah. people can perform. Yeah. And if you do that and make them welcome and say, and encourage the difficult people, you know, the people who've got ideas and they say, you're not doing this right and, and all this and we want change, then don't say, oh, they're trouble, reject them. Uh, you've got to sort of, it's difficult at times, but you've got mm. to embrace that. And I think what I've tried to do is to create a very open environment so that uh, everyone feels welcome, as I said before. So there's an open environment for change. That's I concrete, that, I think. I think it's very yeah. important. Yes. Yeah. Anita. Yeah, you know, my answer is going to be a little bit different. I, I would say that the, the biggest difference is the press coverage of women in sport. The press coverage. That's, yes. Tell us more about that. Yes. Because uh, if you look at the press coverage of the games, and uh, we'll take, take the games in Sochi, you will find that it's, it's proportionate to the number of women and men on a team uh, in, the, in the countries back home. And the athletes are treated with respect, and the, the efforts of the athletes are treated with respect. And it's not a joke. It's not something extraordinary that women are doing remarkable things. And so it's, it's become, shall we say, more respectful. And it is truly reporting, not just speculating. Great insight. Listen, I, I think that we've, we've come a long way. That was a great, great insight, I think. That's true. More media, actually, probably in the future. Uh, you know, Looking, looking at, at your figures, at least on participation, I think we can be fairly content with the way things have been going. The figures in London, at least, uh, from what I read from your reports, is 44%. I mean, we're close to a 50-50 split uh, in, 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 in Olympic participation. However, we, we seem to have a, a problem with this psychological and real 20% line in leadership. Uh, the NOCs, uh, the federations elsewhere. What are the kinds of things we can do to really instigate that kind of change, to, to, 
to transform that 20% into 30 and 40% in the future. What are the, is it a behavioral thing? Is it things that we need to put in place structurally? But what do we need to do to, to have the same kind of success that we're having on broad participation in, in, the, in the elite sport to the upper levels of management and leadership? What are the kinds of things you th we see that we need to have? Okay, I'll go first this time. Uh, I suppose it's, it's really determination. Um, it's determination. not that hard to do. Uh, and recognition that um, when you share, you get more back. And so we need to share the responsibility. When you um, share, you get more back. You do. That's, yeah. um, one of the things that um, we have found, and, and actually we, we undertook, we being the ILC, undertook a, a report that was commissioned with the Loughborough University, uh, we, it was our second report, and we realized that a lot of uh, people in office are staying in office too long, and that's one of the problems. And the ILC itself has a limit on the amount of time a president can stay in office. Uh, uh, Thomas will serve his eight it's years, mandates, right? and, and he'll be able to serve one more term of four years, but that will be the maximum is, is 12 years now. It used to be as long as, as the long person as wanted you until got. you hit the age limit. And uh, I know if you look around, you'll find that a lot of presidents stay for more than 12 years, which... That's a long time. It's a long time, and it kind of moves out people who came in at the same time as that person came in from the opportunity to serve. So perhaps having uh, 12 years as the mandatory or the expected a, a length of time. how long you can be there. That would, that, that would that be a could concrete... make a big difference. Thank you for that insight. What would it be for you? Well, Sir firstly, Philip. I've got to hold my hand up and say I'm in my fourth term in a one situation. So, <laughs> and you're doing a great job, No, Sir no, 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 sure. no, but, uh, but I've gone beyond 12 years, so uh, I won't be going beyond 16, I can assure you. Um, but I, I think also, I think we've got to get into the countries, the grassroots level, uh, if there are, and there are definitely, uh, countries of the world where women aren't equal to men. And we have to get into those countries Join with government as well, not just with sports organizations, and slowly, and it will be slow, but to get the mentality of the men changed. Men have got to change their ideas. And, uh, and, and it's been needed for centuries, but in this 21st century, it's got to happen. Because this world's had enough of men just running it. We need women together. That deserves an applause, absolutely. Okay, I'm, I'm going to to ask you one final thing. We're very focused during the next three days on our personal commitment. Not of our organization, not of our committee, but our personal commitment. What we can do as individuals, leaders, coaches, athletes, whoever we are. What would be your commitment looking forward, the, the time you will have in your mandate or what you're doing in your, even your own community? A personal commitment that you could point towards that you can make to us that personally I'm going to do this to make this go forward to you know lead the change be the change in general in, in general equality what would that be that's my last question to both of you hmm. well I, I've with with uh, in partnership with uh, with President Bach I'm no longer chair of the Women in Sports Commission I've You're been still chair on I'm well I'm still a member of the International Olympic Committee but I'm no longer chair of the Women in Sports Commission I think I have an honorary position but that means that they can't be mean to me if I want to go to a meeting I think well that's, that's, that that's they good. have to listen the door is to always me. open I'm sure for you <laughs> right. Anita I'm sure but, but and that's important to, to have let someone else lead so that the, someone else's uh, expertise can be used so that you can have a different viewpoint I've been there a long time. So it was time for someone else to take, take that. Um, I, I hope what I'll be able to do is to be able to have several more people take leadership positions and to encourage them and to let the men know that it's okay to have women as leaders and you, get, you can lead again too. It's not uh, a terrible thing. Um, it doesn't mean your chance is over. There are lots of ways to lead without being at the head, by the way. You don't have to be in front Encouraging to lead. others to lead yes. is a great commitment. Yes. Thank you for that commitment. You can plug it. Yes. Thank you. Well, firstly, Sir Philip. I don't know where Teen uh, Tileman is. She, she must be in the room. Yeah? It, yeah. Over there? Uh, Maybe. Anyway. 
She that. spoke to me last night, and she's concerned because you know, at a time of change, people wonder: Are we going to still be here? Uh, is is the, is what I've worked for for so long still going to be there? And we've got a board meeting next week, and uh, we're going to talk about maybe changing our council structure, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. She does not need to be concerned. All we are looking for is the best way to move forward. This is not an idea of. Uh, of putting women in sport on the back burner. It's really an idea of putting it forward to the front burner. So that's one of my commitments. And really, the second one is that I'll just take away the title of this conference, leading the change and being part of the change, and just go with it to my maximum capability. I think that's all I can say. We asked for one commitment, you gave us two. <laughs> well, sorry about you that. You are very committed. Give him a hand. Yeah, Thank okay. you very much. And we have something for you, uh -huh. for both of you. Please join us. They want to bring something over to you guys. Okay. Right. It's our same delegation. Hi. Thank you Hi. for your valuable work. Thanks so much. Beautiful. Thank you for your commitment. Oh, thank you so much. All right. Fantastic. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot again. Sir Philip Craven. Thank you. Thank you. And Anita de France, give them a hand. Thank you. Thank you, Anita. Thank you for that. Wow. More commitments. We've gone a little bit more than halfway. Do you like what you're hearing? Is there enough commitment on, in the <laughs> conference, on the stage? Have you ever taken a, a public commitment? In I front don't of know. People. Do you do? When you get married, it's a commitment. That's true. <laughs> I've done that. I've done that twice, so I don't know how good. <laughs> well, it worked out. Well, it worked out fine the other time, I suppose, because I'm still committed to that one. Okay. I'm sorry. I shouldn't maybe have said that, but. Uh, do you want to hear another one? Well, something. Uh, yeah, I've done a short-term uh, commitment. One years and years ago, I was doing a radio show, and huh? we had a charity. Um, we were collecting money for for something, I don't remember what it was, but, but uh, this, yeah, good cause. And then this uh, guy with a lot of money phoned and he said, because he knew of my fear, fear of heights. Uh -huh. okay. He said, if you commit to um, doing something about that fear, huh? he will uh, donate a lar rather large sum of money. Oh. So he suggested oh. I abseil from a big water tower in my hometown, Hanko. You know abseiling? I did. I nearly passed out, but I did. Public commitment is yeah. the power. <laughs> what about you? Uh, something boring. I, I, in Finland, you know, you have these wonderful parties with a lot of wine and, and, and uh, a lot of uh, other liquor, and it's good Where fun. Where is this going? Well, you know, and then, <laughs> and then, you know, this was 15 years ago, and I said, yeah. you know, well, I can run a marathon. <laughs> and there's, oh, no, you can't. Yes, I can. And then, well, this is my fifth marathon. Wow. So, what, this year? Yeah, this year. I will be running my fifth marathon this year. So, I won't public commit commitment to that. is powerful. It's powerful. Mm. Uh, so, listen, uh, we'd like to bring you all on stage. Wish we wish we could bring you mm. all on stage for, for, to bring your own commitment, your own personal commitment for the advancement of equality in sports. But, you know, we have logistic, uh, logistic uh, problems. problems with that, obviously. You wouldn't all you fit know, here. We, we all fit here. But no. we do have a solution, don't we? <laughs> yes, thank God for Twitter. Twitter! Who, how many of you are on Twitter or been using Twitter? <laughs> okay, Twitter. That's a good bunch of people. I, I saw a tweet from President Hallonen this morning. Ah, yes. yes. With the hashtag that we are using for, for this uh, uh, conference, yeah. IWG Helsinki. IWG, hashtag yeah. IWG Helsinki. Helsinki. We want to see yeah. your commitments on that. And hashtag. there's no excuse because I know you all have smartphones, right? Who has a smartphone? Oh, come on, you have them. Everybody yeah. has one. There's no excuse. <laughs> anyway, uh, that is also a perfect platform to, to share your commitment for, uh, for uh, the egality in sport and, and mm. for the advancing this, this important cause. Uh, the only thing is uh, 140 signs, symbols you can use. So and that's straight good. to the point. Straight to the point.
Anyway, now it's time to introduce our next speaker, because our conference would not have been possible without the generous and resolute support of the Finnish Ministry of Education. Uh, their support for this conference and for sport in general is of vital importance, and so it is my pleasure to introduce a very committed politician. She is the Minister of Culture and Housing, also responsible for sport. Please welcome Ms. Pia Viitanen. President Halonen, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, and all dear friends. Finland is very honored to host this conference here in the capital region, and I'm so glad that you all wonderful people are here today. Finland highlights the role of gender equality in sport as a fundamental value, along with the core elements of quality, ethics, integrity and sustainability. Men and women, boys and girls, have differing and sometimes conflicting interests. But above all, we all to consider what is just and fair. These are the reasons why it's so important nowadays to promote gender equality in sport. Gender equality should be the baseline throughout sports culture, from the grassroots level to professional competition, and from training to decision making and leadership. Everyone should be entitled to participate in sport just the way they are, irres irrespective of gender, age, sexual orientation, mobility, or any other aspect in the individuality. This allows not only sportsmen and women, but also the whole sports community to at attain their goals and reap the benefits of their efforts and dedication. In Finland, the status of women and girls in sports, sports culture has developed in a positive di direction during the last decades. However, while men and women now engage in similar levels of physical activity, and women generally have a higher level education, women still are in the minority as sports managers and decision makers. What's more, among the young, the level of physical activity in girls is lower than for boys in all age groups. And this is also true for the level of participation in organized sport. Additionally, the majority of coaches, educators, and ref referees are men. I think the most of us struggle with this problem. In our country, the means of promoting equality in sport have included a range program, mentoring and networking, funding, seminars and training courses, as well as knowledge creation. Alongside these targeted measures, gender mainstreaming has been adopted to ensure that the gender perspective is observed in all areas of activity and decision making. With positive attitudes, targeted actions, and political will, we can make changes nationally and internationally. At the European level, Finland welcomes the latest efforts made by both the Council of Europe and the European Union for gender equality in sport. We wish for strong commitment and concrete actions by all stakeholders in to those aims. I'm sure we all agree a lot, mo lot more work is needed. Creating a level playing field requires team play and calls from determination. For the future, 
it's crucial that gender equality policies can be included in sports organizations' actions plans. Gender equality work must be well planned and coordinated and receive necessary resources. By the same token, it's fundamental to educate sports people at all levels and positions and also develop uh, in, uh, and exchange best practices and share experiences. The aim being to, prom to promote gender equality work in the wider arena of the field of sport. Ladies and gentlemen, the International Working Group on Women and Sport does invaluable work in promoting gender equality. The Finnish government champions this work and will promote legacy of the conference in a future. I wish to extend my sincere thanks to the International Working Group on Women and Sport for organizing this wonderful conference. With these words, I warmly welcome you to the 6th IWT World Conference here in Finland. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Minister, for that. And we have the great honor to have a very, very distinguished speaker coming up next. She is a very successful lawyer and has been also a very successful politician. She was elected twice commissioner at the European Commission, first as Commissioner for Health in 2008, and then she is now, again, commissioner, serving commissioner for education, culture, multilingualism, youth and sport. Over her distinguished career, she has certainly furthered the cause for women in politics, sports, and also business. She has been a great supporter of this particular conference and of the IWG. Please give a warm welcome to Ms. Andrula Vasiliou. Madam President, great leaders and friends of sport, I must say that I do regret that I didn't have the pleasure to participate in the previous IWG conferences, but I am delighted to participate in this one. I'm delighted that 20 years after the World Conference on Women and Sport is back in Europe. What started as a big success in Brighton in 1994 is now resuming here in Helsinki. I congratulate Finland on this excellent initiative. I am proud that the conference is taking place in a member state of the European Union. Much of what we do together in the EU is based on the idea that we can always learn from others, that mutual exchange can be a spur to innovation. And I'm confident that this, confident that this conference will also reflect that spirit. I'm happy to see you all here so that we can learn from your experiences. European sport can benefit from your good practices in the field of gender equality in sport. Your success stories from across the world can serve as inspiration for us to define strategic actions that achieve real equality between women and men. But of course, I hope you can learn also from us, the birthplace of so many sports and excellent programs, the region where the Brighton Declaration was endorsed. The combined efforts of all of you at this conference will contribute to a further change in the field of sport, bringing more equality and thereby also more quality in sport. Do not forget that although your starting point is sport, what you do goes much further. Together you have created a community focused on fighting gender stereotypes 
and accepting diversity and equality, not only in sport, but also in society as a whole. The EU is built on the values you represent, equality, non-discrimination, excellence, which is why we are so proud to be a patron of this great conference and are committed to contribute to actions improving gender equality in sport. The long days of preparation are over. Now the real thing is about to begin. In sport, as in life, taking part, part is everything. But results count, and you can count me in. Good luck to everyone, and uh, be the change. Thank you. Well, have you ever met a walking and talking sports encyclopedia? Well, you're about to see one next. next our next speaker is the president of the National Confederation of Sport. Uh, he's also the president of the Finnish National Olympic Committee. Please wel welcome uh, the very knowledgeable and the very committed to sport, Mr. Risto Nieminen. President Halonen and dear friends, and it's each one of you. Thank you for being here today, and I hope that you have felt warmly welcome to Helsinki and Espoo and Vanta, of course, on every step of the way, from the very first moment you learned about the opportunity. To me, this is very special to be standing here with all of you, hundreds of people, knowing that we have come together for a shared mission. To give girls and women a chance to realize their potential to the fullest in all the phases and encounters of sport. Change happens only in human interaction. And this is what International Women's Group is all about. Your presence, our presence, here makes everything possible. Just a few years ago, I took part in a congress of a major sport association. In the congress hall of hundreds of participants, there were just about 10 women wearing bikini-like outfit and handing out leaflets. I did not feel male dominance. I felt male dictatorship. My reaction was immediate. This way, sport is suffocating its future. We must be running in the front, protecting equal opportunities. People trust us. People need us because sport is global language the most understandable language in the world. Two years ago, I received my best personal lesson in sport. In a conference in Montreal, in a beautiful Montreal, André. That's his home city. I heard Chantal Petit-Clerc speaking. She told her story how she became 13-time Paralympic gold medalist. In the end of her presentation, she showed a video of her toughest race, 100 meters in Beijing Paralympic Games 2008. People in the conference hall jumped up and cheered when she rolled to a close victory. And then she silenced us all by telling Thanks for the cheers, but I did not come here to hear applause once more. I came here to make you understand that I did not win the gold medal in the 16 seconds you just saw. I won the gold medal 
in the 16 years I prepared for it. And if you respect me, don't respect me for the 16 seconds, but respect me for the 16 years. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> it's not the glorious moments or talent we should be respected for, but the work, the passion, and the commitment. Therefore, at this very moment, I would like to share my own public commitment to advancing equality in sport. First of all, in my everyday actions, I want to create an atmosphere of respect. An atmosphere where everyone feels respected and safe to express him or herself, both in joy and in pain. An atmosphere that gives space to the different voices of sport. Second, I'm committed to the targets set by the European Commission supporting gender equality in sport. In the Finnish Sports Confederation and the National Olympic Committee, as well as among our members, I am committed to finding innovative ways of changing recruitment policies for posts in boards and staff, including coaching staff. I also want to help setting up preventive programs to make sport a safe place for everyone. As the president of the Finnish Sport Confederation and the National Olympic Committee, I feel privileged to be a part of this global network of change makers. Welcome to the sixth IWG World Conference on Women and Sport. Our, our men are overperforming at this conference. You ask for one commitment, they give you two or three. That is fantastic. Thank you so much for, for those commitments, Risto Nieminen. And now we're going to be listening to a video greeting from Ms. Fumzile Mlando Nukuka, Director General of the UN Women, the UN's entity for gender equality and empowerment of women. Interestingly enough, from 2005 to 2008, she served as Deputy President of South Africa, overseeing programs to combat poverty and bring the advantages of a growing economy to the poor, with a special emphasis on women. Let's listen to her. Distinguished guests, colleagues, and friends, Mr. Thomas Bach, President of the International Olympic Committee. Sir Philip Craven, President of the International Paralympic Committee. Former President of Finland, Taja Hollonen. It's an honor to speak to you. UN Women was founded to accelerate efforts to achieve gender equality and women's empowerment in every sphere of life. Equality and women's full participation in the world of sport is vital to our task. Sports inspires people to be healthy, to dream, and to succeed. Sports creates role models. It promotes certain good values. It reaches across gender, community, and national barriers. It is our role as women, as well as men, who support equality to ensure that the power of sports is also used to fight discrimination and to end violence against women and girls and promote mutual respect. We must lead the change and be the change. I commend the International Working Group on Women and Sports for your work to support women's engagement in sport and to drive change around the world. 20 years after the Brighton Declaration of Women in Sport, I congratulate you for your success and challenge that you may face and the achievements that you may be going to make. UN Women is a proud partner with a number of sporting organizations, including the IOC, to promote women's involvement in sport and the promotion of positive masculinity in male sporting codes. 
we stand ready to work together with you to lead the change and be the change. Thank you. Wow. That was amazing. Beautiful. You are wonderful. <laughs> this is what we need in the future. Young men, young women working together to do something beautiful together. Yes. It's a wonderful, wonderful way, an elegant way of finishing. Wow. Anyway, we would now take the opportunity also to thank all of our great speakers in this opening ceremony. Please. <laughs> We're getting the same treatment. <laughs> We'd also would like to uh, acknowledge uh, one of our supporters at this stage of the program. You know that the Finnish National Lottery has been instrumental in financing sport uh, in this country. It has been a great partner of sport from the early days of the sports movement in, in, this, in, in this country. And it continues to be a supporter of sport and a great supporter of this event. And they are sponsoring the coffee break that will come soon, we promise. <laughs> and please um, do take the advice of President Hallon, and I believe she said in her speech that coffee breaks are very important. They're the yes, best. Yes, she's nodding, they're the best. She knows what she's talking so about. So take this opportunity to speak with old friends, but also to make some new ones. Perhaps you meet some people that will be really valuable for your yeah. future work. And remember, we're back here at 1645 for a plenary session, Move Me, Physical Activity, Health, and Well-Being for Life. And well, as we've heard so far from all of our speakers, you know, we need to embrace this great challenge together and work hard this week. This is now the end of our opening ceremony, but it's only the beginning. Let's lead the change. And let's uh, be the change. Indeed. Thank you. <laughs>